here's a solar system that you can install yourself without anyone's permission because it doesn't need to be drilled to the roof and it doesn't need to be tied to the grid. If you rent your home like I do, it's super hard to get solar because there's a bunch of problems like you don't own your roof, you need permission from your landlord and your utility, and you may move at any time and then you lose it all. Well, you don't need permission to install a satellite dish or a window AC unit. What if we could design a solar system that's more like that? It consists of 1.2 kilowatts of solar that I got off Facebook Marketplace for $200. A three kilowatt hybrid inverter I got off Amazon for around 500 and a two and a half kilowatt hour battery I got off Amazon for $400. The system's simpler than traditional solar in a couple of ways. First of all, you can install it yourself, but second of all, it's easier on the utility because it only draws and doesn't push back into the grid. It's easier on the landlord and neighbors because nothing's drilled or installed permanently on your roof. And lastly, it's easier when you move. You just take it with you and don't lose your investment. The system can be installed on pretty much any flat surface, whether you own it or not. So in your own backyard, on a balcony, or on my condo rooftop. Let's go check it out. These are four uh, 300 watt or 320 watt uh, SunPower T5s. So the cool thing is I got these second hand. Uh, I think they were originally on a Walmart and, and they upgraded their panels. So I got these for 50 bucks each. And the cool thing about these SunPower T5s is they are, um, they are self uh, weighting and they're built in an aerodynamic fashion where they suck themselves down onto the apartment. So they're rated up to 120 watts, uh, sorry, 120 miles per hour uh, winds and they'll actually suck themselves down onto the roof. because of course I'm nervous, uh, some, some compliance um, uh, uh, ties here just to make sure they're really attached. But generally, um, with these you can lay flat without too much concern. Uh, maybe this will be different in different states, but here in SF we have, I'd say, medium, medium, the max out of medium winds. Uh, but I'm still working on sizing. I may need something a little smaller or a little larger. I haven't been through all four seasons yet. Um, in summer, this maxes out my batteries, which we'll get to in a second, in about uh, an hour and a, a, a 1.2 kilowatts, in about two hours of the max performance. So usually around three hours I, I top out, um, which feels a little overpowered, but then on gray days or winter days, um, it definitely uh, feels good to have that extra performance here. Uh, cool, let's follow these uh, cables down. These are all actually in series. Um, down uh, the stairwell and into the apartment. And as you can see, the cords go from the panels down through here, um, and then these two pretty clean cables we go down the stairwell, uh, down through here. So this is a positive and negative. Here they again continue, and then they go in my kitchen window there. This is where these cables arrive down from the rooftop. Uh, and so they come through the window here. Now this is something a lot of people get stuck on, how to get the cables through the window. I'm lucky enough to have one of these sliding windows. Um, if you have a tipping one, it may uh, work differently for you. Uh, and also in colder climes, this may not work. But for me, what worked nicely is just some packing, packing foam. Uh, I cut it into shape and cut a slit in it that the cables can come through and we get no drafts and it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty solid uh, as a solution there, as a DIY solution. All right, let's follow these cables back uh, from the window. They go behind my fridge, around here, and into the heart of the system, which is a uh, hybrid inverter. Uh, hybrid because it can, it, it's first a controller, so it controls the solar power. Um, then it charges the battery, uh, which we'll get to in just a second. And then finally, it inverts the power back to something usable for the grid. But, and this is special about this model, uh, it can fall back to the grid if we ever manage to bottom out the battery, or if we ever manage to empty the battery. So yeah, this is a three um, kilowatt uh, system. Um, it can charge it up from solar up to four uh, kilowatts, but um, yeah, the, the three kilowatts out is kind of what I care about. And then down here, we have a battery, which is uh, two and a half kilowatt hours. You can actually see it right here. Um, and is a lithium polymer battery. Um, that are nowadays getting pretty affordable. Um, so yeah, this guy, you know, it's not super heavy, but it's, uh, and, and the nice thing is unlike a lead acid, it doesn't matter which direction it's in. You can put it on its side or upside down. Um, 
uh, if that somehow helps it, you, you fit the system. It's a solar system size that would feel about right in an RV. And it acts kind of like a big UPS. So it's off grid, not grid tied, but it can pass through energy from the grid when it's empty. If we ever manage to bottom out the batteries, this can um, pull, this will switch to the wall power. Now, you know, right now our batteries are full and the whole apartment's running, like these lights are running off, off and the fridge are running off uh, the system. So we can just unplug this during the day. The only effect this really has is if we ever manage to bottom out the batteries, then it'll start drawing from the wall. So critically, it never pushes back into the wall. It's not a grid tied system. It only draws as a backup plan when you, when you bottom out your batteries so that your fridge doesn't go off in the middle of the night or your, uh, you can still cook without replugging everything. The system's main use case is backup power. So if the grid goes down for a while, we'll still have a cold fridge. But the rest of the year, the system pays for itself with free energy. So we're making all this free energy. Let's see how we're using it. So here's a full 24 hour cycle. The numbers are along the bottom. And as you can see in the night here, the fridge compressor is the only thing kicking on and off. Then in the morning around 7 a.m., we wake up, we make coffee, we heat, this, heat some stuff with the stove. Uh, and then the base load goes, goes higher because we're charging uh, laptops, screens are on, and um, the Wi-Fi is drawing more. Um, and on top of that, the fridge compressor keeps going on and off. Then at some point, the, uh, the yellow curve, the sun, which has been charging the battery, drops off because the batteries are full. And from then on, really only when the fridge compressor kicks on, does it uh, need to replenish the battery. Then at some point in the evening, um, we start cooking and the sun sets. So we turn on lights and the entertainment system. So the base load goes a lot higher, as you can see here. Uh, and then after that, we go to bed and then the fridge compressor is the only thing drawing from the battery anymore. And pretty much all days look like that. So here's some days where we're using more and then here's a day where we're using less. Um, here is a day where it's cloudy. So you see we have a large chunk missing from the sun and here's an even cloudier and changeable day. So how do we know what the savings are? How do we know how much we're making? We use a horrible app called Desk Monitor, and I would not recommend this. I'd recommend you go and buy solarassistant.io and run it on a Raspberry Pi. So let's talk about um, how um, this powers the apartment now. Um, so let's say the battery's on, as it is now, this, this switch simply is, is a kind of shut off uh, so you can safely operate on the system. Um, this draws energy from the battery or from the solar while it's on, and following this uh, black cable up, it goes up to here to a 2500 watt um, power strip. So this is more heavy duty than a normal one. And then from here, we basically distribute energy over the, uh, through, the, through the apartment. Now, a critical kind of piece of this is that I'm not using my apartment's uh, sockets because we don't want to be um, grid tying this at all. We don't want, we want to avoid back feeding. We want to avoid any kind of involvement basically with the apartment's uh, grid. Um, and so I had to kind of lay my own extension cables throughout the apartment as neatly as possible um, to, to distribute the energy through the apartment. So, uh, you know, these, the kettle and, and these, uh, these heaters here, they run off, um, they could be plugged into the wall, but they run off my own system. And then these two cables continue on. Um, you want to they, they, uh, continue on up through here and then down to my stove here. So this is an IKEA induction stove um, that can that draws up to a, a thousand watts or up to 1200 technically. Um, you want to be careful here to have this on its own cable. Um, so that's why I have two cables as opposed to one with a switch. Because if I was to, let's say, run this and some other loads that we'll get to in a moment and feed it all back into the same cable over the same, at the same time. This is only rated up to 1700 and over the distance we're going only up to about a thousand. So you want to avoid overloading cables and, and overheating cables critically if, you, um, if you're putting on bigger loads on it. So that's why you need to double up on your cables. Every larger load needs to be, um, every larger load needs to be on its own uh, cable. Let's get to the downsides of this system. So the downsides of this method is that we're basically replacing the home's wiring with our own as neat as possible system. 
Uh, and you need to bear in mind how much energy these cables can run without warming up. So as an example, I run a kettle and a few other kitchen devices on one cable, but then on a separate cable, I have an induction stove uh, that I got from Ikea, so that the kettle and the induction stove are never drawing energy through the same cable at the same time, which would go over its limit. Finally, the TV entertainment and kind of Wi-Fi uh, station is on a third cable, and we sometimes, because that maxes out at 400 watts, run another space heater that maxes out at 1,000 watts on the same uh, cable, because that cable can draw 1,700 at 1,400 was safely within that limit. I know that it'll be a two-year payback for me because uh, I pay roughly 55 cents a kilowatt hour. For most people, it'll be more like four years until they get their money back. The carbon payback will also be about four years, which means that after four years, we'll have generated more energy with the system than it used to make the components involved. It's the embodied energy. So there you have it. Solar is a self-installed consumer electronic. Now, it does come with some real downsides, as we've seen. Uh, you need to lay your own wiring in your home and you need to be aware of the max wattage of those wires. Plus the window gap solution that worked for me may not work for all window types or in all climates. But it's possible now, nevertheless, and it's getting cheaper and easier every single day. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, for a full parts list and uh, how I solved certain problems, check out sunboxlabs.com.